Hi, welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV where we talk about Arnold Jacobs, or in this case, John Stevens' tuba concerto uh, all the time. So uh, during this interview with John Stevens, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about his wonderful uh, commission work, uh, commissioned by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, uh, tuba concerto written for, dedicated to uh, Gene Percorni, and uh, I thought uh, it's so substantial that we would just make its own episode uh, where we're talking about that. So please enjoy this this uh, this episode with John Stevens talking about his concerto journey. <laughs> but then forward to when Mr. Percorni came to the Chicago Symphony, you had a, a tremendous uh, opportunity and uh, just impact with this commission over the, the, the concerto for tuba called Journey, which was permitted in 2000. That was without question one of the most important and most wonderful moments and entities in, in my career. It was just, it was a great opportunity and I'm so thankful for it. Um, we can talk a little bit if you want about sort of how that came about. Sure. Gene, uh, Gene and I knew each other as we do, mm -hmm. as colleagues and whatnot. And he had played some of my music, so the, the Schmidt family in Chicago had allocated funds many years before to commission concertos for all the principal brass players in the Chicago Symphony. I think the very first piece that might have been written on this series was by Donald Erb, and I think it was a, a concerto for trumpet, horn, and trombone with orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, Carol Husser wrote the trumpet concerto, Ellen Zwillich wrote both a tenor and bass trombone concertos, mm -hmm. and eventually John Williams would write the, the horn concerto, but it, the, the tuba concerto sort of came up in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. This would have been in maybe 1996. So I got a call one day from Gene telling me about this and saying they've asked me to submit a number of names uh, of composers that you know, uh, I might be interested in. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I, I'd like to submit your name for this. And I thought, oh yeah, of course I mind. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> wonderful, thank you very much. He said, well, you're probably going to get a communication from, essentially from Daniel Barenboim, but through somebody in the orchestra, asking you for scores and recordings that can be reviewed mm. for this. Well, and that eventually happened. They did ask me for scores and recordings. And I remember thinking at the time, this is, I didn't think about it very much because I had no orchestral scores or recordings to submit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I had chamber music things, plenty of tuba things, of yeah, course. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was, yeah. I, I, I had no concerns about anybody wondering whether or not I could write for the instrument. Uh, but I didn't have anything orchestral, and, and so I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. I, I thought to myself, surely this is, there are any number of composers that are vastly more experienced than I in writing for that medium. But I sent in my materials with a letter, of course, and didn't really think anything more about it. Uh, right before Christmas, I think it must have been 1996, so just as 1997 was about to start, I came home from school one day and had a message on my phone machine you know, back in the days when yeah. that's what we used. And um, it was Gene saying, I really didn't want to leave this in a message. I wanted to talk to you, but I, I just can't wait to tell you that you've been chosen to write this concerto for tuba and orchestra. I have to tell you, I had to sit down. I mean, I was, I was literally sort of going, wow. oh my gosh. The enormity. Yeah, yeah, it was an enormous thing, and, and this ties in a little bit to Arnold Jacobs, because after years of sort of revering him and the brass section and the Chicago Symphony as one of the world's great orchestras, the thought of being asked by that orchestra to write a concerto for Gene Picorni right. and the CSO was mind-boggling to me. So as I remember, it took me about a week to even be able to think straight about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but then, of course, the work takes over, yeah. and you think to yourself, well, okay, I'd better get started. And um, because I, I knew Gene a little bit, uh, the, the process of putting this together was a wonderful experience. Uh, we got together and just, I forget whether I went there or he came to Madison or like this, we met in between. Somehow we got together and spent a couple of three hours just talking about what he hoped for. 
And luckily, we were very much in agreement that I wanted to write a piece for Gene and for the CSO, but we also wanted it to be something that would go well beyond that and, mm -hmm. and be appealing to larger numbers of players and playable by more than just Gene. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first decisions I made, or actually one of, the, one of the decisions that he made, which was very important, is that he did not want this to be written for the F2. He wanted it to be written for the, the big instrument. And that was about the only restriction, if you will, that he mm -hmm. gave me. He really wanted to play it on the instrument that he used on a regular basis in the back of the orchestra. Yep. Okay, so uh, essentially a concerto for contrabass tuba. Yep. Uh, that was important for me to know. And beyond that, he said, you know, do what you do. Well, one of my first thoughts was, the tuba's really capable of playing something longer than a, a 12 or 13 minute piece here, and I'm writing this for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. I really, sh I, I'd like to write something pretty epic and, and something of some size and substantiality for Gene, for the orchestra, for the instrument, yeah. for what we do. So that kind of colored that. My discussions with Gene, of course, uh, I, I asked him, we talked about, you know, who some of his favorite composers were and everything, but the, the things that really gave me the, the biggest impetus were his love of trains, mm -hmm. and particularly American steam locomotives, mm -hmm. uh, like the Union Pacific 844. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I already knew that he was a big Three Stooges fan. Of course. Yeah. Um, but the train thing gave me sort of something to hang my hat on as a starting place. Yeah. I've always said as a composer that the most difficult things about composing are beginnings, endings, and transitions. It's a little bit like flying a plane, the taking mm -hmm. off and landing are the hardest parts. Um, so I had to use this love of trains as kind of a starting point to think about where I might go with this piece. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I wrote the beginning of the concerto. Oh, I don't know, the first I don't, 40, 50 bars maybe. And I thought, before I go any further, I want to show this to Gene and make sure he feels like I'm barking up a tree that he likes, mm -hmm. to mix metaphors. So I went down to Chicago and we got together and looked at it and he played over it a little bit and everything. And uh, he thought, oh, this is great. You know, because it, it opens, it's, it's low, it opens in a register that certainly showcases the, the contrabass tuba, and, and he, you know, definitely said, great, you're off to a start, keep going, and that's just what I wanted to hear, and uh, I didn't want to get, you know, 15 minutes into the piece and realize that it was right. not something that he was after. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, but that very beginning, I, and I realized this was going to be more or less an inside joke, if you will, between me and Gene. I, I didn't do this with the intent that everybody would recognize it right away. But I wanted to, to get a little reference to the Three Stooges into this piece somehow. And so the way I got started, and I've used this technique on other compositions of mine. Uh, if you remember, the Three Stooges theme song was essentially three blind mice mm -hmm. played on a you know wah, 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 trombone mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I took the tune Three Blind Mice and I changed the rhythm and I changed the octaves and I wrote the opening melody to Journey uh, as a reworking of Three Blind Mice. Uh, Gene didn't notice it and I don't think anybody would notice it if they didn't know the story. <laughs> Uh, but then w at that first session, I said, well, Gene, you know, play this again. And, and he went through it sort of slowly, and then I, I think there was a piano there, and yeah. I started playing. And when he realized what it was, of course, he, he was laughing and kind of, I think, very pleased with this little personal yep. thing, you yep. know, reference. Yep. And that was it. I didn't go beyond that in terms of, but, but that gave me some basic thematic material to start with. And when I write, I, I don't compose like everybody does. I don't sketch very much. I orchestrate as I go. And I start at the beginning and I write to the end. 
So I started at the opening of the first movement, and I wrote the first movement, and then the second movement, and then the third movement. Because for me, what I've written informs what comes up next. I mean, it, I, I think it's very much like writing a novel where you're creating a plot, mm -hmm. and one action leads to the next, and the next, and so on. Right. So I just went from there. Um, it took me, of, of course, I had a full-time job as a university professor, and so I, I, yeah. I was doing this in addition to that. Uh, it probably took me almost two years to write the piece. Wow. Uh, and then there was a bit of a delay because of seasons being scheduled, and uh, it didn't work here, it didn't work there, and right. they finally scheduled it to be performed in, in June. I think it might have been the very last yep. subscription concert really? of the orchestra in June of 2000. Paired, paired with uh, Copeland's Third Symphony, as I recall. Yes, and the symphonic dances from West Side, Side Story. Story yep. So here was another moment for me. Of course, I was down there with my family and a lot of friends at the, at the premiere performances. Um, to walk up to Orchestra Hall and mm -hmm. see a poster on the outer wall of that hall with the names Leonard Bernstein and Aaron Copeland <laughs> and you <laughs> on it. I, I, I'm not going to deny it. It was, again, sort of like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, Enormity. I, I, yeah. I, I'm a humble tuba player here, but... but you know, composing was always very important to me, and it became more and more important as my my life and career went on. Uh, it it was a huge deal to me. Uh, now I had I, I was very fortunate because the the CSO, like many orchestras, I think had had some sketchy experiences with allowing composers into their presence during rehearsals. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be difficult and tricky. Uh, Gene asked them if it was okay if I came, so I was there for a rehearsal or two. I think probably there was a double rehearsal one day, and I was there for both of them. Mm -hmm. And at one point, they actually, uh, Bill Eddins, who was conducting the premieres, had me come up on stage and talk a little bit to the orchestra and answer a couple of questions and everything. No, no big deal, and of course, they were doing a marvelous job with it. I didn't have very much to say, really, at all. Gene was happy to have me there to listen for balance and see how the, all that was working out. Um, but again, and I'm going to go back to Arnold Jacobs here, to find myself standing on the stage of Orchestra Hall in Chicago, in a place where not only Gene Picorni, but for, what, 40-some years, Arnold Jacobs had held forth. I mean, to us, in our part of the business, there's a, a very special quality to that place. And to be standing on the front, of, not sitting in the back, but on the front of that stage, next, next to the conductor, talking to the members of the CSO, was a huge privilege for me. And again, one of those moments where I was just very grateful that I had the opportunity to be in that spot. Um, I was very confident that the, the piece was working. Um, I used a couple of techniques. You know, it's interesting. I actually studied the Vaughn Williams Concerto quite a bit before I wrote this piece. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned, somewhat to my surprise, when I looked at it a little more closely than just as a player, uh, is that Vaughn Williams orchestrated the most heavily while the tuba was playing, and the least heavily when the tuba was not playing, which gave me a little clearer indication uh, of why there's sort of balance issues in that piece always. So I did two things when I wrote the concerto that, that particularly aimed it with the tuba and the large tuba as a soloist. I, I tried to orchestrate in a, in a lighter, more transparent manner when the tuba was playing mm -hmm. and let the orchestra become bigger and more formidable when they were on their own. And I tried to create a window around the tuba so that Rarely would anybody be playing either in or near the same register that the tuba was in. So it's sort of like the orchestra was like a frame around a picture. And that the tuba, th and, and what I hoped, and I think it was pretty successful, was that the tuba at all dynamics could be heard well mm -hmm. that way and stand out as a solo instrument more than we sometimes do. Yeah. Um, and then the premieres were great fun, and Gene, of course, played beautifully and and it was uh, I was really thrilled because he obviously really liked the piece um, 
and then it, it went on from there. A few years later, he lobbied to do it again, and we did it uh, in December of 2003 during the Midwest Convention, so there was a great audience there, and, and I don't know, the, the whole thing was a, a wonderful privilege that I'm very grateful for. I really appreciate you sharing all that detail in, in the process, and uh, uh, I had scheduled the, was scheduled to be there to, in the audience, I had bought my tickets, the uh, uh, family issue came up, which, which disallowed me from traveling to Chicago in Savannah, Georgia at the time, but but I caught the radio broadcasts and uh, and made sure I, I taped it on my cassette my cassette player. Yeah, yeah. And so I still have that uh, to this day, and uh, very much appreciate that piece. And then, of course, bought the piano reduction. It's in my file folder at uh, uh, back in University of Oregon. So it's, uh, it's a, a piece that none of my students or I have, have yet played, but it's it's there, and that's something we pull out from time to time. Well, I'm, I, it hasn't been played a lot with orchestra. It's a you know, it's a, almost a half hour yeah. piece, particularly when Gene played it. It, it was because he really took his time on all the yeah. cadenzas and everything. You know, there, I, I, I should tell one other humorous little story about the premiere of the piece. Gene and I found out after the, the piece premiered that up in the balcony, uh, it was a packed house, of course, and uh, there, at any symphony orchestra concert, you're always going to have people in the audience for whom, you know, anything that happened after Beethoven, probably they don't care for quite so much. Yeah. Um, you know, traditional uh, concert goers. Right. So apparently there was an older woman up in the balcony who, at the end of one of the cadenzas that connects the movements in Journey, was heard to say rather loudly, oh, Thank God that's over. <laughs> and and Gene and I, being who we are, what we both thought that was just hilarious. That that was wonderful. Uh, but the reaction to the piece, the the reviews, while they they weren't um, you know glowingly spectacular, were just fine. Reviewed Gene's performance and the orchestra's performance very well, as they should have, and and seemed to think the piece was just fine. I've never been a composer that that lived and died by reviews, anyway. And I've been grateful that a lot of people have played the piece, particularly with the piano reductions. Actually, one of my former students, undergraduate students, who went on to do his master's at the Manhattan School of Music in New York, won uh, one of their concerto competitions and played the entire work wow. uh, with the orchestra there. And a couple of my students at Madison played parts of it with our orchestra. Yeah. Um, another fantastic experience for me uh, during March of 2014, during my last semester before I retired from UW-Madison, one of my graduate students put together, a, we put together a little retirement weekend that involved a chamber music concert where I played with the Wisconsin Brass Quintet and we did a big alumni tube euphonium ensemble where we had nearly 50 people on stage over all the generations. It was just fantastic. But the reason it happened in March is because Gene was available and my student contacted him and Gene agreed to come up to Madison and perform Journey with our UW Symphony Orchestra. Wow. And our orchestra conductor came to me and said, would you like to conduct? And I said, you bet, oh my gosh, that would be just tremendous. So I actually got to conduct the piece hmm. with our very fine UW-Madison Symphony Orchestra with Gene as a soloist. And, wow. you know, again, I mean, I, I keep coming up with these kind of magic moments related to this piece, but they were, they were all just fantastic. And That's incredible. Yeah, it was great. It was just great. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.